Well, the Christmas season is upon us, the season of festivity and joy, the feast of warmth and light and life in the midst of winter. So I want to talk about death. Um, I'm not just being perverse, for, as we'll see, the hope that we celebrate in Advent has a great deal to do with death. But in any case, although the shop windows and the advertisers uh, will not let us think about it much, Christmas is, in many ways, a season of death. I'm told there are more suicides at Christmas than at other times of the year. I think the gaiety and glitter that we associate with Christmas can make it a very bitter time for lonely people who have no parties to go to and no relatives to visit and feast with. It's also a time when many old people die from what we call natural causes, which often, quite often, means that we've deprived them of enough money to keep warm. Besides all this, Christmas is a time when we remember most poignantly friends who have died, who are not there as they used to be to join in the feast. Two very close friends of mine died earlier this year, and I know that I'm going to miss them particularly at Christmas. Surprisingly, Christmas can be a time of mourning just because it's a time of celebration. So, I want to talk a bit about death and mourning. I want to talk about why we should be angry about death. I want to suggest that just as at the center of our sorrow for sin we discover forgiveness, so we can discover at the center of our grief a hope in resurrection. Death, human death, is in the first place an outrage. I mean, it's outrageous in the way that the death of other animals is not. Because in human death, nature takes back more than it's lent us. Every human death is a kind of murder. Put it this way, as every cat person knows, each cat is a unique individual, different from every other cat. But it's unique because of what it's received from nature, from its genetic makeup and from what's happened to it during its life. When a cat dies, this unique life is no more. And this is, of course, sad, but nature has simply taken back what it has given. I can grieve for the death of a cat, but with the death of a friend, there's something much more, something of a different kind. We have an instinct that finds the death of a friend somehow unfair, outrageous, and I think we are right to trust this instinct. For my friend is a unique, irreplaceable person, not just because of what she has received from nature, but because of what she herself has made of herself. By her own free decisions, by the spontaneous love she had, by her failings, by all the things we could praise her for or blame her for. For unlike the cat, my friend was in part responsible for herself. In a way, she created the kind of person she was. She wasn't just made, she also made herself. She belonged to herself. She wasn't just a part of nature. And now, in the natural course of things, the lifetime of a body has come to an end. But nature, in claiming back her own, has also taken away the unique personality of that body, which nature did not give. There are people who will pretend to see death as quite natural, as natural as birth, but I think they should look again. Human life, unlike other life, is more than a simple cycle of birth, growth, maturity, decline, death. During and within this cycle, there is a story. 
there's the development of a person, which is not a cycle, but a continuing story that's arbitrarily cut off by death. Most people will agree that there's something shocking in the death of a child who hasn't had a chance even to live out her whole human life cycle. But I think that in one way, every human death is the death of a child. Every death cuts off a story that has infinite possibilities ahead of it. Human love is about bodies, about being with each other, about bodily, physical presence to each other. Those who love find it hard to be separated from each other even for a few weeks, even by a few miles. They try to communicate, which is a way of trying to be bodily present. Death is terrible because it is so absolute a bodily separation, the final bodily absence. What had been a living body in which a unique personality was present to you is now not a human body anymore. It's lifeless clay. We are right to be angry about death. And anger is a large part of mourning for the dead. And we are right to be angry with God. It's just as appropriate to be angry with God as it is to beg his forgiveness or to ask him for anything in prayer. Of course, God doesn't literally need to be told what we want and what we need. But as we saw earlier, it still makes sense to lay our desires before God. In the same way, of course, God is not literally blameworthy, but it still makes sense for us to lay our anger before him. Remember that in all these cases, we are dealing with images of God. And in all these cases, the literal truth is that the initiative is always with God. What is happening is not something happening to God, but to ourselves by the initiative of God's grace. As we saw last time, we need, besides the image of the God who is relenting, accepting, also the image of the God who is angry at injustice. And now I say we also need the image of the God with whom we can be angry. If you think this is shocking and irreligious, go back to the Bible, read the Psalms, read Jeremiah, Read the angry words of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If we suppress our anger at death, if we don't allow ourselves to mourn, or if society or the church will not allow us to mourn, if we do, if that happens, we'll pretend to ourselves that there is no death. And then we shan't cope with it. To, pre to pretend that death is unreal is to be very like those who pretend they have no sin, the self-righteous. As we saw last time, contrition is a kind of mourning for sin. It goes with confession, with being able to admit that we are sinners, and that nonetheless God loves us and forgives us. It's one and the same gift, one and the same gift of God for us to admit to our sin in sorrow and for it to be forgiven. And it's one and the same gift of God for us to mourn for the reality of death and to have hope in the resurrection. Those who can't admit the reality of death sometimes convince themselves that we are not really these bodily animals. The real me, they think, is not this body but a spiritual soul loosely attached to the body. This true spiritual me, they think, doesn't die. It just carries on when the body disintegrates. Now, this disowning of our bodies leads to, to philosophical muddles, to psychological troubles, and to very bad theology. I am this material animal that God has made. 
true and this special kind of animal that God has made able to make itself, to be creative and free, but I'm not some idealized spirit harnessed to a dying animal. I am this dying animal. I have hope beyond death, not because I think I am a phantom, constitutionally incapable of death. I have hope because the bodily animal, Jesus Christ, has conquered death. Uh, philosophers have sometimes argued that there is an immortal element in me, a part of my life that does not die, and they may well be right. In fact, I usually think they are right. Of course, that bit of me, that soul, would not be me. What I am is this whole living, breathing, thinking animal. But perhaps some of what it is for me to live humanly and creatively is not subject to decay. Perhaps, but anyway, I do not hope because of what philosophers argue any more than I have faith because of what philosophers argue. I have hope because God raised Jesus from the dead and I am promised resurrection and eternal life in him. Jesus was not immortal. He was a mortal man and he died. But God conquered death in him and now he has a new immortal bodily human life. And because he is not dead, because he is bodily, he can be with us truly and humanly in the body. To try to understand the resurrection, or rather to cope with the fact that we cannot understand it, we need to go back to what we saw about so-called unanswered prayer. You may remember that I said that all our prayer is a kind of sharing in the great prayer, which is the cross. When Jesus, in loving obedience to his Father, accepted failure and handed his whole work over to his Father. This was the prayer that was answered by his resurrection and the redemption of the world. Now, when we die in faith, we share in the death of Jesus. We share in the prayer, which is the cross. And we share in the answer to that prayer. You may remember that I said there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. God never gives us less than we ask. But sometimes he gives us so much more, so much more than we ask, that we don't yet recognize it as an answer at all. Sometimes, true, he treats us as children and gives us simply what we ask, and that's easy and delightful. But sometimes he gives us a greater gift and begins to show us that we want something greater. He helps us to grow up. Now, sometimes the divine power does answer the prayer for life by giving us just exactly what we ask, as when the dead are brought back to life, like Lazarus. But usually, he gives us far more than that. He gives us resurrection, which is more than we can yet understand, more than we know enough to ask for. Like so-called unanswered prayers, death is also a process by which we learn and grow up. The gift of resurrection looks to us now like a prayer that has not been heard, not been answered, ignored. Because we're not yet grown up enough to recognize it as what we really want. But if through our lives we've prayed, then we know quite well how often we've seen by hindsight how what looked like a non-heard non prayer was a prayer answered in ways that we couldn't understand at the time. It will be so with our resurrection. We shall look back and see that our new transfigured human life is really what the prayer of our death was all for, just as the resurrection of Jesus was what the prayer of Gethsemane and the cross was all for. But meantime, let us not pretend that for most of us, 
death seems anything but darkness and loss. But a darkness in which we have hope. Christians have no theory about life after death. We don't think we're grown up enough, old enough to understand such eternal life. We have instead our faith in the love of the Father, our faith in Jesus Christ, that the spirit of love in us will conquer death, and our future is the substance of things hoped.